In the 70s and 80s, cartoon villains were mostly petty losers. Characters like Doctor Doom and Skeletor would be defeated by the end of each episode, only to shake their fists and grumble at their minions until the next one rolled around. And things played out mostly the same all over again. But Gargoyles co-creator, co-producer, and writer Greg Weissman wanted to change that. Gargoyles, which ran from 1994 to 1997, was a Disney show about ancient monsters that are, as the opening credits, Let's put it, stone by day, warriors by night. But it would become much more than that, gaining a cult following in the years since it first aired that has kept it near the top of the animation landscape from that time period. And much of that reputation is the result of how Gargoyles treated its villains, and how, in doing so, it helped to redefine cartoon villainy in the 90s. Weissman had worked with Carrie Bates on the DC comic series Captain Atom, where the series antagonist, General Wade Ealing, always had plots within plots. When Weissman and Bates teamed up to write for Gargoyles, they designed their primary villain by taking that quality but stripping away Ealing's cruelty and intolerance, instead fusing him with another comic book character's traits, those of Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne in the comics I read growing up was charming and a guy that, you know, you'd admire. So what if you had a handsome villain who would say things like, revenge is a sucker's game? He just wasn't into being a villain. He was into meeting his goals. The result was David Xanatos, a genius billionaire who remained a dangerous adversary throughout the show's run because he always had so many redundant plans that he somehow emerged victorious even after seemingly being defeated by the heroes. His complex schemes became such a model for future villains that he's even the namesake of a TV trope. The charm and humor that Weissman wanted for the character, who would always be the hero of his own story, was perfectly captured by Star Trek The Next Generation's Jonathan Frakes. I love playing a villain. Everybody does. It's the best. So much more fun than playing a good guy. It's more colors. You can be somebody that you're really not. It's a delicious job. Frakes had auditioned for both Xanatos and the leader of the Gargoyles, Goliath. He credits the strength of the character to the writers and voice director, Jamie Thomason. Gargoyles was ahead of its time. Gargoyles was, I think, too smart for TV. They didn't pander to a children's audience. It had a lot of Shakespearean references. It examined the battle between good and evil in a very dense, interesting, psychological way. It had an incredible cast of actors. Greg Weissman credit. The writing was very, very smart and funny at the same time. Frakes joined the cast alongside his TNG co-star Marina Sirtis, who had originally auditioned to play the Gargoyles' human ally Eliza Maza, but was asked instead to audition for the role of the series' other primary villain, the traitorous Gargoyle Demona. Frakes and Sirtis went from playing heroic Starfleet officers to recording Gargoyles, where, unlike many animated shows, the voice actors all performed in the same room together, and the rapport the two actors already shared certainly helped with the development of their Gargoyles characters. Marina Burma my dearest friend and one of my favorite actors. We have a great shorthand together. The Gargoyles writers kept Demona sympathetic by making her her own worst enemy. She was partially inspired by the X-Men character Magneto in her desire to protect Gargoyles from the people who hate and fear them, even if it meant killing all humans, and the Gargoyles that would try to stop her. I think we created two villains in Demona and Xanatos who were truly unique in cartoons of that day. I do think she's a tragic character. It doesn't justify her behavior, but there's a tragedy behind that that's real. When looking to bring tragedy to his characters, Weissman combined his passion for comic books with an unlikely inspiration for a kid's cartoon, Shakespeare. The most obvious result was the character of Macbeth, an immortal version of the Scottish King with a touch of Batman to him between the use of martial arts and his tech gadgets. His long life came from a mystical connection with Demona that he sought to end, putting him in the unique position of being both an enemy to the heroic gargoyles and an occasional ally. We love the irony that he'd confront Goliath and say, I'm actually after your queen, Demona, and then Goliath just laughs because he's like, Demona tried to kill me last week. If you think kidnapping us is going to help you get Demona, you may have a problem. The writers of Gargoyles largely avoided the common villain motivation of revenge. Even though Demona had betrayed Macbeth, he really wanted to kill her because he was suicidal. He's lost everyone he ever cared about, and he can't die unless Demona dies. And through the efforts of our heroes, he begins to learn that there are still reasons for him to live and to go on. So once he sort of leaves that suicidal mindset behind, 
which obviously, because we were a kids' show in syndication, we never uh, spoke to objectively, but we hinted at clearly. Being a children's cartoon created more conflicts than just a need to be coy about dark character motivations. It also meant hard restraints on how the writers could depict violence and death. Weisman's team hated the Disney villain death, a common trope where the antagonist is killed off screen, typically through their own actions, and they sought to subvert it every chance they could. For example, in one story, the megalomaniacal archmage seemingly fell to his death, but was actually rescued by a time-traveling version of himself. Meanwhile, Macbeth's scheming rival for the throne, Duncan, fell off a cliff, but only after he was shown burning to death because of a magical artifact. The show was also able to show a surprising amount of on-screen carnage by having characters who had been turned to stone bloodlessly smashed to pieces. That liberty was most noticeable in the Ark City of Stone, where Demoni uses a spell to transform all the humans in Manhattan into stone from sunset to sunrise. Sometimes the decisions that came down seemed a little ironic to us. You can show Demona smashing or blowing up a handful of characters, but we just don't want it to start to feel gratuitous. We wanted her to blow up someone as she exited the scene, and they were like, it's too much. Someone said, what if she just fires and blows off the woman's arm, but otherwise she's fine? And so the answer was, okay, you can do that. And I thought, wow, that is dark, and they don't even realize it because Everyone else, you know, is shattered into a million pieces. They're just dead. They're gone. I mean, it's horrible, but they're gone. But this woman's going to turn back into flesh at sunrise, and, and half her arm is going to be gone, and she'll bleed out. It's just horrible. Conflicts with Disney executives weren't always as predictable. During a check-in with Gary Kreisel, then the head of Walt Disney Television Animation, Weisman and writer Gary Sperling described an upcoming plot where Xanatos married his mercenary leader ally Fox and the two had a child. While the episode hadn't yet aired, it had already been written and animated. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You can't do that. They're the villains. You can't have the villains have a kid. I mean, what are you going to do? You can't take their kid away from them, but you can't let the villains raise a kid. What are you doing to that poor kid? There's silence at the table. And I said to Gary, we already did it. Rather than scrap the work, Disney allowed the plot to move forward, and it helped grow those characters and even provided a chance for the villains to team up with the heroes to protect their son. But while many aspects of the serialized story were planned long in advance as the Gargoyles team sought to build a complex universe, they were also open to changing course. Fox was originally just intended to be a loyal minion who deeply admired Xanatos. But then, Wiseman heard actor Laura San Giacomo read the line, There's not a thing you can do to stop him. He's the most brilliant man on the face of the earth. I was like, holy sht. Fox is in love with Xanatos. That's really interesting. Let's run with that. We began to conceive of this idea of them getting married. And then we thought, well, Xanatos wouldn't marry a minion. He has to respect her. And so we began to develop her as a more fully realized character and develop their relationship. Episodes showed the two were equally matched in chess and explained Fox's complex backstory as the daughter of a wealthy businessman and the fairy queen Titania. While Xanatos originally explained their relationship as a matter of genetic compatibility and similar goals, it grew to be real love and helped make Xanatos an even more complex character. You are the one called Goliath? Yes. Excellent. Another case of villainous serendipity came when Wiseman was listening to the sound mix of the video release of the first five episodes of the show, and kept hearing Eliza actor Sally Richardson say Thalog, which is Keith David's character Goliath's name, backwards. I thought, we've got one of the greatest actors of all time, Keith David, playing Goliath, and he is marvelous in this character. But their whole aspects of his talent that we just can't use because it would be just totally out of character for Goliath. What if Goliath were the bad guy? What if you took Xanatos' mindset and put it on Goliath? Let's have Xanatos clone Goliath, educate him the way Xanatos thinks someone should be educated. And what comes out the other end? It's Goliath's opposite. The origin of that was hearing this word backwards over and over again. We just tried to stay open to that kind of stuff. 
Not every villain plot Wiseman wanted to do was accepted. A two-parter story where the powerful witch is responsible for the link between Demona and Macbeth, the Weird Sisters, trapped the heroes in a production of Shakespeare's play was deemed, well, too weird to risk two episodes on. Wiseman scrapped the idea because he didn't think he could cram even the most condensed version of the tragedy, plus a framing device, into just 22 minutes. I wanted to use Shakespearean dialogue and I thought we could do it and I thought the kids would get it. It would be elevated, but under understandable, and I was convinced I could do this. And they were way less convinced than I. <laughs> but that was the thing about this show. Wiseman and his fellow writers were always pushing the envelope in terms of what a quote-unquote kids show could do. And that influence continues to be felt in the world of television animation to this day. Wiseman considered Gargoyles to be a superhero show without capes or tights. After the third season ended in 1997, he would continue his work crafting complex villains for comic book adaptations like The Spectacular Spider-Man and Young Justice. Yet there are still many fans who would like to see Xanatos, Demona, Macbeth, and the rest of the Gargoyles characters get another chance to shine. For more on great animated shows, check out IGN's list of the top 25 adult cartoon series, and be sure to like and subscribe to IGN wherever you watch.